The first mathematician to do a thorough analysis of unicursal mazes was the prolific Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler in the mid-18th century. His interest in the subject stemmed from an answer he presented to the St. Petersburg Academy in 1736 to the problem of the bridges of Konigsberg. The question was whether it was possible to walk from anywhere in the East Prussian town of Konigsberg, present-day Kaliningrad in Russia, and cross every bridge there exactly once before returning to the starting point. Six of the bridges connected the banks of the river, three on either side, with two islands in the middle, while a seventh joined the islands. Euler reduced the problem to its mathematical essentials and in this way made it much easier to solve. He realized that the only information of relevance had to do with the connections. Each landmass could be thought of as a point and each bridge a line joining two points. Euler was able to prove that for any arrangement of points and connecting lines, it would be possible to arrive back at the starting point, having traversed every connecting line exactly once, if and only if a certain condition was satisfied. This condition was that either no point along the way had an odd number of connecting lines, or only two points did. Since the Konigsberg layout of bridges failed to satisfy the rule, there was no way to solve the original problem of crossing all the bridges just once and returning to the place you began. The beauty of Euler's approach to the famous problem was that it could be generalized. His Konigsberg analysis provided the first clear mathematical definition of a unicursal figure as one that obeys the rule of connectivity just mentioned. But more importantly, his work on this puzzle gave birth to a whole new field of maths known as graph theory, and was important too as an early contribution to another major nascent subject, topology. Both graph theory and topology are among the tools that mathematicians can bring to bear when tackling the more complex subject of multicursal mazes. Not only are such mazes designed to pose a mental challenge, but also they can be fiendishly hard to solve, exist in two, three or more dimensions, and take a form that doesn't at first sight even look like a maze. Outside of legend, the first maze of which there's any historical record is that referred to by the Greek historian Herodotus, who lived in the 5th century BC. He describes a maze in Egypt so grand that all the works and buildings of the Greeks put together would certainly be inferior to this labyrinth, as regards labor and expense. Whether it was actually a labyrinth in the sense of being unicursal, we don't know, but if Herodotus is to be believed, it would certainly have been impressive, with twelve courts, 3,000 chambers, and one side consisting of a pyramid 243 feet high. Among more recent puzzle mazes are those that European royalty had built on their property to amuse guests or provide places for secret meetings and trysts. The one at Hampton Court Palace on the banks of the Thames, commissioned around 1700, is the best known and has now become a popular tourist attraction. The oldest surviving hedge maze in Britain, with walls tall enough to block any view of the way ahead, it covers some 60 acres, but isn't hard to solve. Though not unicursal, it has only a few places where the path forks, so that no one can get lost for long. Daniel Defoe mentions it in From London to Land's End, as does Jerome K. Jerome in Three Men in a Boat. We'll just go in here so that you can say you've been, but it's very simple. It's absurd to call it a maze. You keep on taking the first turning to the right. We'll just walk round for ten minutes and then go and get some lunch. Far more convoluted is Il Labyrintho Stra, the Labyrinth of Stra, located just outside the city limits of Venice. 
In the grounds of the Villa Pisani and created in 1720, it's reputed to be one of the hardest public mazes in the world to solve. Even Napoleon, a smart guy and no mean mathematician, is said to have been baffled by it. Anyone, however, who manages to navigate their way through the nine concentric rings of the maze, with their multiple openings and branches, can then climb the spiral staircase of the turret at the centre to get a bird's eye view of the whole affair. Two record-breaking mazes are in the United States. The Dole Plantation's giant pineapple garden maze in Hawaii, made up of 14,000 tropical plants bordering two and a half miles of paths, was declared the world's longest in 2008. Meanwhile, not to be outdone, Cool Patch Pumpkins in Dixon, California, grew a corn maze that earned an entry in the Guinness Book of Records as the largest such temporary maze. So confounded by it were some visitors that, fearing they wouldn't escape before closing time, they dialed 911 to be rescued. Let's suppose then that you've just entered a maze about which you know nothing for the first time. You've no idea how big or complicated it is, the walls are too high to see over and there's no one else around with whom to compare notes. All you've been told is that there's a goal, a place in the middle that you need to reach in order to solve the puzzle, and definitely at least one route that leads there. A classic and straightforward approach is the wall following method in which you keep your hand in contact with one side of the maze and just keep walking. This will work in many cases in the sense that it'll eventually lead you to your goal, but it has two drawbacks. First, it may take you a very long time, and second, it may fail completely if the maze has loops in it as well as dead ends that aren't connected to the outer wall. The key to solving mazes in a systematic way that won't let you down is to turn to maths.